Trigger warning. Please be advised that Locked and Loaded Diaries talks about themes of suicide, homicide, sexual assault, and other wrongful deaths. to bet that you think most military deaths happen in the combat zone. Think again. Nearly three quarters of all active duty U.S. military deaths between 2006 and 2020 occurred not in the war theater of Iraq or Syria or Afghanistan, but in places of no conflict. And of that 74%, 93% of deaths happened here on U.S. soil. My name is Kimberly Walker, and I'm an Army combat veteran. These statistics sent me on a goose chase about what was happening in the military and how did these soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines actually die? What did the military know about these deaths, and what were they telling these Gold Star families? Well, I went straight to the source. They have done all the legwork. Please join me and my battle buddies and Gold Star Mothers, Terry Caserta and Heather Hedge Baker, where on every episode we will talk to a Gold Star family member and find out what happened to their service member versus what the military told them and the justice that they've never received. Are you ready? Well, we are. Welcome to Locked and Loaded Diaries. Good evening, Locked and Loaded Diaries listeners. Uh, Welcome to our weekly podcast on non-combat deaths in the U.S. military. I'm Kimberly Walker with my co-host Terry Caserta and Heather Hedge Baker. And tonight our very special guest is Griselda Martinez, sister of Enrique Roman Martinez. Enrique's name should not be a shock to hear anybody say his name because there have been numerous articles written on Specialist Roman Martinez. Rolling Stone Magazine, Task and Purpose, Stripes, Fayetteville Observer, Army Times, and more have covered the cruel, brutal murder of Specialist Roman. Uh, 21 years old, stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. He uh, was a uh, human resource specialist and those who know the military, that's your PAC or your S1 personnel. Roman was with 82nd Airborne Division, 37th Brigade Engineer Battalion, the 2nd Brigade Combat. Roman, it was first reported that Specialist Roman, I'm gonna call him Enrique, was missing on May 23rd of 2020. And if you were paying attention in 2020, not only was it a brutal year at Fort Hood, but it was an especially brutal year at Fort Bragg with 44 non-combat deaths at Fort Bragg. These are non-combat deaths. We're talking accidents, illnesses, but also suicides, drug overdose, homicide, and homicide by suicide. Enrique went camping on Memorial Day weekend. 
it was during COVID, but that is nothing new for soldiers to go do stuff they weren't supposed to do, like going camping during COVID. That's that's just something that's expected of soldiers because soldiers want to have fun on their downtime because they work so hard. Um, apparently, they had a, a little bit uh, too much fun. I know that there was um, reports of LSD usage on that weekend. Um, but uh, Enrique went camping with six other soldiers and then on May 23rd, they reported Enrique missing. Just one week later, his severed head would be washed up upon the shores. Um, it was just, it's, it's just, I'm gonna use that word that I always use is unfathomable. The, the truth to this story is so horrific and unbelievable that you probably wouldn't believe that it actually happened unless it wasn't all over the news. And with this story all over the news, why doesn't anyone know anything? Especially with six other soldiers. And guess what? They all, all belong to a unit. And that unit had a leadership. And those soldiers have family members, but no one knows anything. CID put out a $50,000 reward, but no one knows anything. Is your career that important that you would let a family suffer to the the degree that they will suffer for the rest of their lives if they don't find out what happened to Enrique? Is your career that important? Can you not do anything else besides the military that you would not step up for a fellow soldier and say, I'm gonna do the right thing. I know what happened. Yes, there is retaliation, but guess what? Their safety in numbers get together. And I'm gonna go ahead and say it, grow some balls and step up and do the right thing because these stories, they don't end. You know, 2020, it was a horrible year and it started with Heather Hedge Baker's son, Caleb in dying in the barracks on Fort Bragg and then and in between that, in between Caleb and Enrique, there were more and you've heard the stories and we've already talked to a lot of the family members. So you'll be hearing more stories about the prestigious Fort Bragg 82nd Airborne Division. I'm gonna go ahead and call out the division command right now, Major General Donahue and Command Sergeant Major David Pitt. Get it together over there. What is wrong with your leaders? Soldiers are a reflection of their leaders. That you have rotten apples in your formation who killed another soldier. And then, and after thousands of interviews, the investigation was over a year and a half and you close the case because you can't figure it out. How incompetent is CID? We've seen this over and over again with CID. I served 17 years in the army and you know what? I just have not seen this level of incompetency ever. I don't know what's going on. Veterans, fellow service members, speak up, tell people, Call your people that are still in and they're high ranking and say, what is going on? Do something, help these soldiers. Enrique was 21 years old. He had the rest of his life ahead of him and a huge family and friends that love and support him and talk about 
about him as if he was still alive. What does that say about him as a soldier, as a person? When you speak about them in the present tense, how do you sleep at night, General Donahue? And I know we get in officers shit all the time on this show, but those senior enlisted, you guys are where the rubber meets the road. Remember that saying? Soldier, sergeant, not soldier, officer. It's soldier, 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 sergeant, 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 before we even get to an officer. What is going on in the enlisted ranks? Why didn't anyone take care of Enrique? This is only our fifth episode and I'm already pissed the hell off. Griselda. <laughs> um, we really appreciate your time. We know that this is not an easy story to tell and that you've got other things going on in your life because even though the, this case was closed, some recent um, information has come out about the soldiers that were there with Enrique, that they are being held accountable for certain things, but not necessarily murder. So if you want, you can start the story at the beginning, or you can start in the present and and backpedal your way to the beginning. Um, that's up to you, whatever would uh, be easier for you. Um, Are yeah, you ready? So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm ready. Um, well, uh, well, I guess I, could, I should tell you more about my brother um, and why this is so important to me. Um, so Enrique is the youngest one of uh, three siblings. Um, it's my older sister and I, and he's the baby. Um, he was the one that my mom always wanted. He actually planned one, right? Um, that was her boy. She prayed so hard for a boy. Um, she got two girls and then she prayed even harder and said, please God, if, if I'm good, if I'm a good person, please just give me a boy. And she got her boy, right? She was so happy. This was her everything. I mean, she loves me and my sister, but Let's be realistic. She loved my brother more, and that's okay. Um, it's really quiet, really timid, um, very um, generous, very loving and doting brother. Um, he was just um, a great kid. He's very intelligent, um, very practical. Um, he cared a lot about his work, um, whatever he did. It was just the most important thing. Um, in his high school days, he was a handful for sure. Um, I actually took care of him a lot because our mom was working constantly and was gone from five in the morning and would come home at eight at night. Um, so I'd make sure my brother got to school, he was fed, his homework was done. And um, just so my mom had one last thing to worry about. Um, sometimes he wouldn't come home and I'd blow him up, where are you, where are you? He was like, my friends had a bad day. I went to go accompany them because they just needed someone to listen. Okay, what time are you coming home or where are you so I can pick you up? I'm here and there, okay, we pick him up and he got home and get right to his work. Um, he loved to play video games. Oh my goodness, he, let me tell you, he was really good at video games. I could never, um, he actually has his own YouTube channel. I don't know what it is. I just heard of it, but he was really good at playing video games. That was his passion and he loved anime. So um, pretty simple guy, you know. Um, I, would, I would always ask him, hey, when are you gonna get a girlfriend? He's like, once I'm out of the military, I'm getting a girlfriend because if I get a girlfriend now, she might, you know, go somewhere else or I might leave her behind when I leave and I just don't want that kind of relationship. Okay, that's totally fine, you know. And um, I guess the biggest shock to us all just, before any of this was, why do you want to go to the military? You know, my 
my brother's not a fighter. He's a very sweet guy. He's more of like a let's talk it out kind of guy. Um, it was just astounding. Um, one day um, he calls me, he's like, where are you? I'm like, I'm at work. Uh, aren't you supposed to be in school? He's like, yeah, I am. But I'm bringing some, some people. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, I need you to come home so you can translate for my mom. What are you talking about? Oh, these soldiers, they're here um, to recruit me, you know, and I just need you to explain to my mom that it's okay. And I'm like, are you crazy? I hung up the phone. I left my job. I went and was adamant. You're not going. You're not going. This isn't for you. This is not for you, you know? Um, he was like, no, it'll be great. Look, talk to them. There's benefits. Um, I'll have a steady income. I can send you guys money. Um, I'll be able to go to college. You might able be, even be able to go to college. You know, we can make it work. And I told him, no, 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 no. Um, we, we don't need any of that. We can all work together and we'll figure it out. But he was persistent and persistent and persistent until, you know, he was 17 at the time. It was either he would go because we were okay with it or he was just going to turn 18 and leave himself. So, you know, translated for my mom, talked to her. I'm like, you know, it's kind of what it is. And when I tell you my mom didn't want him to go, he, she did not want him to go. Um, like I said, my brother was timid. He's not a fighter. He's not an aggressive person at all whatsoever. Um, so for us, you know, when you hear of a soldier, you think of someone who's ready for combat, someone who's strong. You think of the drill sergeants, you know, my brother one time cried because someone bullied him at school. And I can only imagine what a drill sergeant would do to my brother. It's just, he was just not that guy. And um, so my mom looks at the recruiter, told him, do you see everything about my son? Every hair on him, every piece of him, everything um, down to his armpit hair. You see how I'm giving him to you? Do you guarantee me that you'll give them to me back just like this in four years? The recruiter said, yes, ma'am, of course. The army is the safest place in the whole world. So you can just imagine how ironic it is that we only got my brother's head back, right? Just, it's crazy. I don't know if it's the universe playing games with us, but yeah. Um, it's nuts. They'll say anything, anything to get them to join, you know, and my brother wasn't stupid. You know, you've heard of all the things that they use to try to, you know, qualify people to go into the army. Um, he got one of the highest grades in the little written test, um, had to try a couple of times for the physical, um, which is okay, you know. Um, yeah, and um, I dropped him off where he had to go when he was ready to go. Um, I stayed with him until it yeah, was his time. My mom couldn't go because at the time, technically she was illegal because her visa expired and we didn't have money to renew it. So she had to stay outside of the building. I took as many pictures as I could and videos of him on that day. And when he swore in, oh my goodness. I was like, no way, he's going to do it. He's going to really, really do this. I'm so proud of him. Then he left and, you know, he told us, I can't talk to you, you know, um, they don't permit us to have phones. Okay, no problem. You go do your thing. Um, if you don't want to do it, just call us. We'll pick you up. Don't feel ashamed. You don't have to do it. Okay. No, I'm going to do it. Okay, no problem. Um, he called me a few days before his graduation ceremony and said, are you coming? And I told him to what? He's like, my graduation ceremony. I'm like, what do you mean? Um, what? He's like, yeah, it's on this day. If you can't come, that's okay. I know you don't have too much money. I'm like, no, I'm going to go. Don't worry. And I didn't know how to buy, buy a plane ticket at that time. I didn't know how to do anything. I've never flown in a plane before that. It was all super new to me. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was going to get there. So um, I bought the ticket. I had someone walk me through it. And, and I got there. You know, I luckily I was able to get a rental of, got a hotel and I watched him and I videotaped everything. I took as many pictures as I could again because my mom couldn't fly. Um, we couldn't afford more than one ticket so my sister couldn't go and she had a baby at the time. So we really couldn't afford it. And um, 
So I went and I was just really proud. My mom was too, when I showed her the pictures and everything, she's like, wow, like he's, he's not a baby anymore. He's not, he's not a baby anymore. He's, he's a nice grown man now and he's gonna do this. <sighs> Sorry guys. Okay. So my brother, you know, I still call him and, or I would call him and he would tell me, oh, this is great. This is so fun. You know, I'm having a great time in the army. I'm meeting so many people from so many places. I've gone here and here and here and, you know, and are you eating? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm having a great time. There's so many things. It's not like you know, there's so many different people. It's not like California, like, oh my gosh, this is really cool. I want to travel. This is great. I really hope that I can travel in the army. That's great. I'm so happy, you know, so happy for him. And um, he was telling me um, how he was trying to be a ranger and he didn't quite make the cut. That's okay, you know. So he was going to be a paratrooper because he gets paid a little more and he's always wanted to jump out of planes. Okay, cool. Good. Do that. Please be careful. Um, you know, he told my mom, my mom got so scared. She's like, oh my God, oh my God, I'll be praying for you every time you jump. No, like, you know, God can't take my baby away. Like, I'm going to pray for you every time. And the first time he did actually call my mom and ask her to pray for him. So he was safe. And, um, and he would jump. He jumped a lot. Like I said, if he was going to do something, he was going to try to excel as much as he could. Um, he wasn't a very tall guy, wasn't a very muscular guy, um, but he, he really tried his best. Um, I, I've heard so many great stories about my brother and how funny he was and how he always tried to lighten the mood when everything seemed too serious. He would always try to lighten the mood and um, that's just who he was. Um, he was always there for someone to listen. They needed someone to listen to, um, to them. He would be there and um, I'm really proud of him. In the short time that he lived, I'm very proud of him. And I know my mom is too, you know, um, I was her baby. <laughs> when I say he was the best one out of all three of us, he really was, he was just a great all around person. And, you know, maybe that was his downfall was the fact that he was such a great person. Um, maybe a little bit too kind, too generous. Um, so after two years of, two and a half years, no, two years of being in the army, um, it flipped. So instead of saying, I love the army, I'm excited. He's like, I hate this. I hate this. I hate my job. So much paperwork. Um, you know, would complain to me about how higher ups, um, would try to make an example of him, despite the fact that he already did all the work, everything was done. Um, but as soon as a higher up would come, they would be like, and that's what I expect. I expected you and I had to do all this just to get you to do his work. And he would just look at him and he would tell me, Griselda, I just looked at him like I already finished. I didn't need them to tell me to do anything. And, you know, I had to explain to him, you know, that's how people think that they can get ahead in life and you shouldn't let that bother you um let it go don't ever if anything let your work show your worth don't ever let them put you down okay you're right and you know he would call me and it wasn't anymore I'm excited it was I hate my job or I hate the army I don't want to be here anymore um my legs hurt oh god I gotta do this you know and that I didn't, I see the red flags now in retrospect, which I blame myself for, and I know I shouldn't. Um, there was one day he just called and he's like, I'm done, I'm done with this. I want to leave, I wanna leave. And this was pretty recent, um, a little bit before um, 2020, something in 2019. Um, I believe he was getting surgery for his leg and he had told me that he was just done with this, he was done. And I talked to him, I was like, what's wrong? What do you mean? You're almost done. Why would you, you know, why would you go part way? You know, you, you didn't just join this army just to, not, not to be 
mean, but not just to serve. Um, you joined it because there was benefits to it. Are those not important to you anymore? No, they are. You just don't understand how they are. You're like, well, what's going on? Talk to me. And he didn't want to. He didn't want to tell me what it was. Like, I just can't, I just can't talk about it. I'm like, well, I understand that it is bothering you. I don't know what it is, but I know it's not anything you can't overcome because I believe so much in my brother. And when I look back, I feel guilty because maybe I did expect too much of him. And just the person I knew he was, he was smart, he was reliable, he was just great and would make any situation better. I expected too much on him. And um, he said, you're right, I, I can stick this out. You know, and I told him, yeah, you know, there was a lot, you know, you told me, you were the one who told me that this would be good. And this is something you wanted to see through. And I believe in you, I told him, whatever it is, I know you can overcome it. Just told me, yeah, you're right, okay, I'll stick it out. I'm like, okay, good, um, I'm here for you. You let me know, is something going on? No, nothing's going on. Okay, okay, you know, and I let it go. And we would talk and he would just say little things about how work sucks. But I mean, who doesn't say anything about how work sucks, right? I thought he was just becoming an adult. I didn't know if there was anything else behind it or anything like that. Um, so fast forward to 2020, you know, um, he mentioned something to me in January that he had to go to a class um, because he got disciplined um, for something and he didn't tell me what it was. And I was like, okay, you know, that's right. He's like, yeah, it was just a party and I was drinking and you know, everybody got in trouble. Um, he didn't tell me the whole story. I'm like, okay, well, that's okay. You know, you did, you did the deed. So you have to do the time. He's like, I know Griselda, I know. Can't you just listen sometimes? I'm like, I understand, I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, we just got on to talking. I didn't pressure him anymore. He had already told me he was going under a lot of pressure because I believe they had to deploy like 300 some troops to Iraq at that time. So I didn't pressure him about it. And this was around January. Um, I let it go. But after that, I, I just called him regularly um, and I actually talked to him the weekend before he went on this trip. I talked to him that Wednesday. Um, I asked him, what are you doing? You know, it's Memorial Day weekend. Do you have an extra day off? And by that time, the, we had the lockdown. And I told him, why don't I go visit you? You know, I've never visited you. I can go see you this weekend. Like, you know, he's like, no, don't waste your money. There's nothing to do here in North Carolina. It's backwoods. And, you know, I don't think I, I would feel bad if you flew out here, wasted money. I don't even have a car to drive you around, you know? Um, and I'm like, that's okay, I can get a rental. He's like, yeah, but uh, maybe we could do something else with that. And I'm like, okay, you know what, that's fine. And we had talked about previously about um, going to visit my dad in Mexico because he had gone deported like maybe 12 years ago and my dad was a raging alcoholic, but my dad had been doing better. So he was like, well, let's just save it for then. And you know, I didn't, question him okay that's fine I told him what are you doing this weekend he's like oh well it kind of sucks because there's gonna be a parade and there I might be called to it so I just have to kind of keep my plans open okay no problem what are you gonna do if you don't do that well if I don't do that he said I'd just be playing video games with my friend okay you know and he told me I'll have to call you some other time I have to do something real quick I'm like okay no problem so he didn't call me back that's okay um I tried calling him, I believe, um, later that day. Oh, yeah, he didn't answer me. Um, I left it alone, you know. I'm like, okay, you know what? He's probably busy. If it, he is going to get called to patrol or something, then I don't want to bother him. So, you know, I go all weekend. Um, don't hear anything from him. I just kind of, okay, I'm just going to let it go. Um, Sunday, uh, me and my sister, or I mean my mom, went to Costco and she told me, she's like, yeah, you know, I bet this number has been calling me three to four times. And I'm like, what are you doing? Um, answer it. Are you like, why would, why would a number call you several times? Come on, mom. She's like, oh, okay, whatever. So she answers like, hello. And then they spoke in English. So I took a call and they're like, hi, so is this the mother of Enrique Roman Martinez? 
um, I'm his sister, but I'm translating for my mom. What's going on? We just want to know if your, your brother is there. And I'm like, why would my brother be here? Isn't he with you guys? What's going on? Well, your brother's been missing. So um, because he has three months left, we're thinking maybe he went home or something for the weekend. And I'm like, no, he's, he's not here. No. What do you mean? What happened? He's like, um, he's been missing since Friday. And so, you know, we left everything. We left. We just, when I tell you we left, we just left. Um, I'm talking to him. I'm like, what's going on? Like, what do you mean? He's like, he went camping. Do you, any, do you know anything about that? I'm like, I have no idea. My brother didn't tell me anything about that. And I told him what I knew. And he's like, oh, well, he went camping with some buddies from his barracks and he's been missing since Saturday. First, he told me Saturday morning and then it turns out, oh, it was Friday night. Okay, um, what do you mean? Like, how did this happen? Why didn't you call us earlier? You know, well, we were hoping he was gonna show up. You know, he's grown adult, yada, yada. We were hoping he was gonna show up. I'm like, so didn't you call his phone? You know, I, I'm just getting to, just trying to find out what, what do you mean, what's going on? And then he's like, no, he left his phone and his wallet and his glasses there. And I said, no, there's, there's no way. First of all, my brother can't see without his glasses. No, his, he's stuck to his phone 24 seven. I'm like, and there's no way he would ever leave his wallet ever. And he's like, well, well, that's why we're calling you. We're maybe thinking maybe you picked him up or something. I'm like, why would I do that? What, that doesn't, and I'm like, okay, um, well, you guys call me if you find him. Yeah, so I called and I'm like, when are his friends coming back? Where are they? And they're like, they're there, they're helping. Um, park rangers look for him and I'm like what do you mean and then at one point they're going back and I'm like okay and I would call and I would call and it would they didn't get there till like one in the morning just super late and I'm like where the hell did they go that they got there so late um so I'm going up the line I'm like look like I just need to know what's going on so then after a while we're like you know what no no we're not going to stick around like we we need to go and see what's going on so we got on the first plane and left on Tuesday. We were going to get there Wednesday. Um, we flew out. They had told us they were going to do a search team. They didn't do the search until Tuesday, I believe. And then by that time, it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. My brother's been gone for four days. Um, because I, why? I don't know. Um, my brother's disappearance wasn't reported to CID till Monday morning. So can you imagine? seven even just seven at night on a Saturday and you don't report it till Monday morning um it's kind of crazy that was Colonel Tan at the time um you know I don't understand why he waited so long when they got to the island they're like it didn't take them long to search the whole island there is nothing on that island you can't really search half of that island because it's all marshes anyway um my brother had compartment syndrome in his legs, which meant that he jumped too much, um, that his muscles weren't getting an appropriate amount of oxygen to them. So he had to have surgery for that. He couldn't walk. He couldn't really run like he used to. He was getting medically discharged. Um, so it's not like he was in a spot to run away or even swim, attempt to swim across to try to, you know, leave. So, I'm telling them there's something wrong. There's something wrong. He's in danger. There's something wrong because my brother never leaves without his stuff. He's not in the best physical state. He doesn't, he can't see. There's something wrong. And they're like, well, we're just looking, you know, we're just hoping, you know. Okay, you know, when my mom and I got to North Carolina on Wednesday, um, we went, we talked to them. They wanted to question us about my brother's behavior. And I'm like, I, I don't understand, you know, what this means. And they're like, well, this means, you know, just in case, so we know his, you know, would he really kill himself or not? And I'm like, no, my brother would never kill himself in a million years. He would never kill himself. I know him. Maybe he, he makes jokes about it, but what, what kid his age doesn't, you know, it's just a new thing. And he's like, well, it's just some people have been saying, I'm like, well, those people are fucking wrong. Excuse my language. 
because I know for a fact my brother would never kill himself. I'm like, we've talked about it. He told me he's too much of a coward and he could never do that to my mom. I know my brother, he would never kill himself. Okay, okay, ma'am, okay, we, we understand, you know? And then they started asking me other questions. See, aggressive, I'm like, my brother is not aggressive. And I understand that they were uh, just asking questions, but you know, you would think that maybe his colonel, his sergeant or his captain would know him a little bit better to say, to really, you know, describe him. So that happened, we, me and my mom head to Cape Lookout right away, um, it's kind of late. So we really didn't get to go to the island until Thursday, um, we, go, we get there Thursday. And I'm thinking these, you know, they're not looking like it's, they're just not looking right. I know my brother, I know where he would be if I, he was hiding. Well, let me tell you, I got to the island and there was nothing. <laughs> There's nothing, that island is barren. There's no hills. There's no huge forest. There's nothing. Um, the park rangers were incredibly kind. Um, they got us there. They, you know, um, got the boat and took us there. Um, we walked. They showed us the whole island. They took us to all the houses. They've, they've already gone in there, looked everywhere. That's it. It didn't even take more than four hours to just get through the whole thing. That's crazy, you know, you, you really think about it. That, that's crazy. And um, well, we, we were just like, all we can do is pray, you know, I asked the park ranger questions. Um, does this normally happen? No, it doesn't. And if it was a drowning situation, the body would have showed up by now. I asked her, um, is it ever weird? Like, do you ever get parts of bodies? No. Not necessarily, sometimes they're just missing an arm or a leg, but you know, it just, just depends on the situation. You know, there was a storm. I asked her, where, where do drowned bodies normally show up? And on the map she showed me, it's on the next island over, it's called Shackleford Banks. Okay, so I just, we just have to wait. If my brother drowned, then maybe he'll show up there, right? Um, and at least it'll be his whole body. Well, no, right? And um, so we looked, the army was like, look, why don't you guys stay closer to the base because Cape Lookout and Fort Bragg are about four hours away. If you go to the closest point, they went to the furthest point, which was a little bit longer, about five hours, five, six hours even, just depending. Um, so, we changed, you know, we checked out of our hotel. We're like, I mean, there is really nothing I could do at Cape Lookout unless they find his body and that's it. So we went and went over there and said, okay, what are you guys doing to look for him? I asked to go to his room. Um, oh, they just kept put it, pushing us off, really. The CID agent they assigned to us spoke Spanish. Um, was really good at deflecting. I don't like that. Um, so you can only imagine the kind of bitch I was. Um, he would tell me in time and time, we'll get things, you know, and I'm like, I want it in writing. Um, I want to know what these people say. You're going to give it to me. He's like, yes, yes, I will. In time, in time. Okay. All right. So you got to give me time to dry it up. Okay. No problem. I'll wait. I'm here for whatever time. I didn't really buy tickets to fly back. I, I'm not concerned, you know? So the next day um, we're at our hotel and we're like, oh yeah, can you come? I'm like, yeah, we can go. Like, What we wanna do is we wanna get swabs just in case something turns up. Okay, no problem, we go. Um, and, um, by that time, it was already Friday. Um, you know, they do the whole swap thing. They talk like, what are these people saying? Can we see them already? In time, in time. Okay, okay. And um, so they put us in this room 
and they're like, we need to tell you something. What is it? Like, you need to sit down. I'm like, I don't, I don't need to sit down. My mom, maybe. And it was this morning. They found a severed head. Um, washed up on Shackleford Banks again. I had already asked, right? I already kind of knew where it would be. And it looks a lot like your brother. I'm not gonna lie, I was in denial. It can't be him, it can't be. There is no way that's how my brother was gonna meet his end. And um, I can't describe to you just the cry that my mom let out. That was her baby, that was her son, that was her everything. And she just dropped to the floor and uh, I think I will always remember that. I'll never forget that ever. I just, I couldn't, I, I couldn't even, I couldn't, I couldn't even shed a tear. I was so shocked. I was so like, I just, I didn't want to believe it. It just, it just couldn't, it just couldn't be true. I just, it, there's no way, you know, I, I guess like I was just so much shock and pain seeing my mom cry, knowing I can't take it away. And I told them, how do you know it's my brother? Yeah, and they were like, it looks like him. And I'm like, what if it's someone else? And they're like, I don't think so. I'm like, well, do you know for sure? No, it's just, okay, then until it's a for sure, then I'll believe it. And I'm like, maybe it's someone else that looks like my brother. And I told my mom, you know what, let's just wait until they do the DNA. Let's just, let's just be hopeful it's not, you know, because they told us that there was so much damage to him, but that was my brother. Okay. So I wanted to stay there. My mom and I talked and if it's him, then what are we gonna do? It's not like we could do anything else right here, right now. Why don't we just go home and just be with my sister, um, be together? Right, we went home and we were just praying and praying and praying. You know, I think about it now and I'm like, dang, you know, I was really in denial. I just did not want to accept it. It just, it just, I did not want to accept it. Not him, maybe someone else, but not, 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 not my, not my baby brother. Just, just no. And um, sure enough, a week later, um, dental records, DNA records, that was my little brother. And, and I told him, I'm like, is this homicide? You know, um, my CAO, I love her to bits. Let me tell you, I was such a bitch to her in the beginning. It wasn't even her fault. And um, she's like, I, I'm not sure. I was just told to deliver this news. And I'm like, okay. Okay, so I called the CID agent that had been deflecting and I asked him, he's like, oh, we're not sure yet, okay? Sometime later, homicidal, you know, it was labeled homicide. You couldn't have told me, you know? I was so mad, I, man. I ripped him a new one. I was like, I don't understand why that's something you just couldn't tell me. I don't understand why it took you so long, why I had to find out from the media that my brother was murdered. Well, it's not murdered, it's homicide. No, it is murder. Why couldn't you tell me? You know what he told me? He said, you're lucky that as many updates as you've gotten, that you're getting them because most people have to wait for us to call them. 
So yeah, okay. You're lucky that I'm even communicating with you. And I said, oh, okay. Is that really how it is? And he said, yes. I'm like, okay. He's like, so next time, wait for my phone call. And I said, okay, no problem. Hung up. I called the CAO. Hey, you're supposed to help me, right? Yes, this is what happened. Um, how do I get a supervisor? Very kind. She got me the supervisor name. CID agent chancellor talked to me. I told him, what is this? Like, that's my brother. He didn't just die in war. This wasn't like he was on the front lines. My brother was I only have his head. How can you treat me like this? I don't understand what kind of empathy this, this man has. How, how can he not sympathize with me and my family when my brother has just been brutally murdered? How can he tell me, oh, he's like, I'm so sorry, ma'am. You know what? I will be in charge. No problem. You don't have to talk to him again. I'm like, good. I don't want to. Um, there is no reason that he should have treated me like that. And that's how I got um, in contact with CID agent chancellor. And from then on, um, it would give me updates. I'd call him, um, it was a lot better than, you know, Mr. Deflecting, um, his name was John, um, awful. <sighs> he couldn't tell me what these people said. He just, with the story that I just kind of had before and that's it. Um, he couldn't give me any, transcripts because now it's a, it's a case and you can't really do that anymore I couldn't go to my brother's room I only saw pictures of it um it's very stressful very very difficult um I just couldn't I didn't you know I didn't want to let this go the fuck is this um is bullshit. I'm not gonna stand for this. I went to the media, I emailed ABC, I emailed everybody that I could. I had my friends email. Um, I had been on Facebook and Instagram asking for people to help me. Um, actually, while we were looking for my brother, right? Um, I had joined every North Carolina group that would possibly know Cape Lookout, so hiking groups, all of the community groups near um, Cape Lookout. Here's a picture of my brother, please, please. If you've seen him, please, you know, so I had a lot going on there. And that's when I kind of started to go everywhere, just wherever I could listen to me, wherever I had to go where someone would listen to me, I just posted like crazy. Um, his friends reached out to me, is it true? Is it true? I'm like, yeah, it's true. And like, we can't, we can't let this go, you know? And they helped me. It blew up on Twitter. It blew up on some Facebook pages. And I, I just, wherever I could, wherever I could, I just posted. I just had to do something, you know? When, when I said I just had to, um, not, not my baby brother. It just, it could not, it couldn't be him. And he was, I was gonna do something about it. and. It was really hard um, doing it by myself. Um, I mean, I had his friends, you know, I had people. So I'm like, I was completely alone, but for the most part, I was alone. Um, I was trying to comfort my mom, my sister, um, trying to explain to my, you know, this extended family. Uh, it was really difficult. Um, I would call them for updates, didn't have much. Um, so I got in my way, I called the medical examiner that did my dad, my brother's autopsy. And I told him what's going on. Um, it's his head, but how is it? How is it a homicide? Please tell me, how is it a homicide? I need to know. It's like, are you okay to hear this? I'm like, I, uh, I need to know, I'll be okay. I'll figure out how to be okay later. It's okay, just, just tell me. <sighs> He's got some missing hair. No more eyes. His eyes were gone. His eyes were eaten out by the crabs, by the fishes. 
They're gone, no more eyes. There's some bruising on his cheek. We don't know if it's from his head beating in the water, ton of decomposition, um, chop wounds to the back of the neck. Um, they missed at one point because it was too difficult and went lower. So there was a lot of chop wounds, broken jaw. I've never seen the autopsy pictures. Um, I can only imagine what they look like. I, I can't do that to myself. I could never ruin the last image I have of my brother. So I just, I can read it just fine. You can explain it to me just fine, just like that. Okay. Um, I knew I had to get a lawyer. So I don't, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I've never had to get a lawyer in my whole life. I've never had to try to go to the media. I've never had to talk to the army like that. Um, this was all so new to me. Um, I had my manager from work. Well, she's my friend, but she's worked with me since, shoot, I was 19 years old. So this lady was, is my work mom. She's my friend. Like she's amazing. And, um, she guided me and she said, okay, I have a friend of a friend, um, who knows this lawyer in North Carolina, maybe it's best. Um, they're in the same time zone. Um, he's right there. If he has to, you know, drive there, that'll keep you from having to fly back and forth. I'm like, okay, you know, um, he's a criminal lawyer and, um, he was okay. Um, this wasn't his priority. Um, I did pay him. It wasn't really his priority. He didn't get back to me um, quick enough. By the time I'd, he'd get back to me, I've already had the answers anyways. I've already called whoever I had to to find this answer. Um, and so I let him go. You know, I'm like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I don't know how to get a lawyer. I, I, don't, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so, um, the same time that this was going on, Vanessa Guillen's um, story exploded, which was great. I'm so happy for that. And um, my, um, again, my friend, um, hey, this company or this uh, organization, I'm sorry, is helping Vanessa Guillen. Maybe they could at least help you a little bit, okay? I wrote to them, I called them. Um, they were able to help me, which was great. Um, they got me in contact with um, Leonard. Um, he was a representative of LULAC for California, which was great. Um, Leonard also knew a lawyer. Awesome. He's like, I've seen him in court. He's amazing. Okay, cool. He's like, yeah, you know, he doesn't really do these kinds of um, cases, but he might be able to help you because I've told you before, I've seen him in court and he's amazing. Like, okay, I called him. He's like, you know, I'm willing to do this pro bono. You know, I, I want to help you. Like your family story, you know, really inspired me. Like, you know, I said, okay, thank you. Yeah, if you don't mind, we would really appreciate the help. I have no idea what the heck I'm doing. He's like, that's okay. We'll, we'll figure this out because they've screwed up a lot. You know, they waited to call me. They didn't let me know, you know, about the homicide charges and boy, just the way they treated me. Um, he said, he, I can only imagine how they treat other families. Honestly, they're in no position to treat any families like that at all whatsoever when they're the ones that fucked up. Yep. So Justin became my lawyer. And um, let me tell you, <laughs> Dustin is amazing. Um, I didn't have to do it by myself anymore and it was great. He was really great help. Um, all the questions I had, he had the same questions. Um, he would do briefings with them. Um, we would both 
he, they'd give me one, they'd give him another. We would both ask questions and what have you. And it's just, sorry. Um, you know, um, so from then on, Justin helped me a lot. And the questions, you know, started. Why wasn't my brother's room locked up right away? Because apparently people went in before his head even showed up. I don't understand why you wouldn't close it, close it off. Their reasoning was, what if he comes back? Then he would have to report to one of you guys. What do you mean? You would just let him go back to his room? What? His room wasn't closed off. Um, when they sent us back his stuff, there was stuff missing. I know he had a journal he kept. Um, his social security card was gone. Should have seen the way he, they packed his stuff up. They just threw it in a box. Like it didn't matter. This was my brother's stuff. This was it. This is what we had left. And just threw it in a box like nothing. And, um, you know, there's obviously missing things. I don't know everything he had, but I knew there was a few things missing. A couple books I know he owned, they weren't there. And uh, he just died. Like you couldn't preserve his, you, you couldn't be bothered to make sure that it was done properly. He already died and you sent his stuff like this. I know he's dead, but you couldn't have had a little bit more respect for him and his belongings. It's a lot. And um, I don't know if there's like, you know, someone divine out there, you know. Um, I mean, I believe in God, but I don't know to what extent, you know, the universe works. But um, when I started to try to figure out who these people were, you know, I dreamt of my brother and I dreamt of who these people could be. Um, and they did, they came, they came in my dream. So when I asked them about it and I asked them if these were the people and they're like, we, we can't answer that. Okay. So I got to, like I said, I messaged his friends that from his battalion. So as soon as this all came out, you know, you could see who his friends were. Cause I post on Facebook. I post on his wall, I can't believe you're gone. And I messaged them, do you know anything? Do you know these people? Like, oh yeah, we do know them. He did hang out with them. Okay, so it could be them. And um, talk to them, do you know anything? Was he wrapped up in anything crazy? Not that we're aware of, he was really quiet. He was pretty, pretty chill guy, you know? Okay. And his friends were a big hope. We got me the names. Um, they all reached out. A lot of them did, and would tell me great stories about my brother. And it helped. Told me that these there are seven of them actually, and um, that three of them were just idiots. <laughs> they always got in trouble. And. Easter in particular, I had asked my brother, hey, or two actually, I had seen him post a, post a picture of them when they went on a camping trip before. And I had asked him before about these people. He said, and I asked him, I didn't know you had friends. You hung out like that. That's really cool. You know, he's like, those are not my friends. They're just my acquaintances. And I said, okay, you need to calm down, buddy. And he said, no, I just want you to get it straight. They're just my acquaintances. I'm like, okay, no problem. That's okay. I have acquaintances too. It's all right. So now I know that these are just acquaintances. And they told 
their higher ups that they were best friends. And so they weren't, they really weren't friends. Um, just acquaintances, like my brother says, I'm sure he just played video games with them or hung out with them sometimes, you know, and when I asked his friends, they're like, yeah, they, they have their own little clique. Your brother was more of like, if they need an extra person, they would call him because he's pretty, you know, reliable. He's pretty like, yeah, chill. Yeah, I'll chip in, you know, and I'm like, yeah, my brother was really nice, really reliable, really generous. Um, he would be that person to call. Who doesn't get lonely, right? You miss your family. You have friends, but sometimes friends get, you know, they go to different bases. Like at the time, his best, one of his best friends um, had gone to Korea and I realized my brother was lonely. That he felt the need to go with these people. You know, I'd ask CID, how? Like, I, he told me he wasn't going to go. And they told me they had already had this trip planned for more than six months. And I'm like, well, don't you guys have COVID restrictions? Yes. You couldn't go past 50 miles from the base. And I'm like, this is like 200 miles. And they're like, yeah, they violated those rules. I'm like, but they're planning this trip. How can they leave? Didn't anybody like catch them? No one was checking on them. Like, you know, no, no one checked on them. Okay. Like we're not babysitters. I'm like, I understand. But I mean, if you can enforce rules, you're going to enforce rules, right? I, that's what I thought the army was, but I, I guess not. Um, okay. So um, I guess just jumping back, there's some things I forget. Um, it was seven, no, six in the beginning. I turned seven because um, they were hiding the girlfriend of one of these people. They were hiding Anna. Anna was the girlfriend of Alex Becerra who made the 911 call, right? They were trying to hide the fact that she went on this trip. I have so many guesses as to why. Um, I've heard that she's been in so much trouble before, um, that this was kind of like the last straw for her. I heard she was underage drinking because she was underage, a lot of things. And um, okay, so they were really trying to hide the fact that this girl went on the trip. Okay. There was drugs involved. Those kind of drugs don't make you kill someone. They really don't. I've never heard of such a thing. I have friends that do LSD and cocaine and drink alcohol and I really wonder how they're still walking and their brains aren't fried. You just don't kill anyone when you're doing that, you know? What did that have to do with my brother? Because as far as I'm concerned, the autopsies reported that he had no drugs in his system. Ma'am, you know, we, we don't know. There may be an altercation. I'm like, well, how do you not know? Like you're, in, you're the ones interrogating these guys, this girl, like you guys should know. Oh, well, we asked them, like, you asked them? How did you ask them? You, it really makes you wonder sometimes how they ask them. There's a difference between, hey, were you there this weekend? And there's a difference, like, why were you there that weekend, right? There's a big difference there. I always, I, I don't know if that they actually interrogated them. Like, I feel like it should be. So they didn't want to confirm the names. I waited. Um, I'm supposed to trust the army. I grew up in the United States. You know, I learned the Star Spangled Banner, the Pledge of Allegiance. I, oh, say, can you see? I, I can sing all those songs for you. I love my country. My parents may be from Mexico, but I love my country, you know? Um, I wanted to be a good citizen, um, you know, I, this is my country. I live here, I grew up here. Not that I don't, you know, accept my culture. I just, this is, I was proud to be an American. I had a brother that was in the army. I was so excited for him to come home. 
And, you know, you see in the movies that the U.S. Army is so noble, so they have, they're equipped, they can figure it out. Because if the, something happened to the president, holy shit, the army would be out in a second to defend the president, right? You would think at least one of their own, they would do the same. No, it's really not the case at all. They just want to sweep it under the rug because you know what? They don't want people to stop joining the army. They don't get paid a great salary. Why do you think a lot of these 18, 19 year olds are trying to get married right away to get more money? There's no bonus. There's not like what it, they brainwash them with this illusion that, oh my goodness, you're going to get so many benefits. Like it's going to be great, you know? And no, no, it's not. And my brother was brainwashed and I lost my brother because of that. I wish I remembered who this damn recruiter was. To really just tell him, what the fuck, man? I'm sorry. Where's my brother? Where's the rest of my brother? They don't tell you about this. They don't tell you about soldier on soldier crime. Like, it's crazy. Fort Bragg, too. One of the most prestigious prestigious bases. They have the 82nd Airborne, the first line of defense for America. Yeah. Except if it's one of their own, because you know what? My brother would have given his life for this country, his whole life. And I'm only asking them to just, who killed my brother? I'm only asking who killed my brother and I want justice. Why is that so wrong? Because seven of your soldiers are going to be responsible. That's crazy, you know? Yeah, and um, I think the hardest part of it all is my mom. They thought just because my mom only spoke Spanish that she wasn't probably was illegal well my mom has a reason now so wasn't that you know they they just really thought that they could push us over you know just family of three women no no you know they they thought wrong they they it was the wrong wrong person I wasn't gonna let that and I know when I'm being managed and I know on several occasions they're trying to manage me Oh, you know, these people, they still have lives. That's not my problem. My brother doesn't have a life. What about my brother? That is not my problem. You know, it's just, um, you know, they, they feel, you know, we feel bad because everybody else is treating them wrong. Why? I don't feel bad. I don't feel bad one bit because they're still breathing. They're still living. They're still, they know their family loves them still they're still alive and my brother is not I don't care what happens to them I don't care if they weren't even if maybe a couple of them weren't responsible for my brother's murder I don't care because they all know something and I know that for a fact so with everything else that's coming out now I'm really hoping that things will take a turn. They, the craziest thing that honestly just makes me the most angriest is they had told us back in September that they were not closing the case, but it was going to be a cold case because Griselda, I have no idea. We have no idea. We've investigated their families or childless. I know everything about these kids. We, we just don't have any evidence to say that they did it. These kids, you know everything about them, so you feel sorry for them? No, no, that's not what I'm trying to say. Okay. I've heard enough. I've heard enough. Like, you're telling me that you know these, these people, these kids, and you just don't, there's nothing really pointing. There's no, there's no reason, rhyme or reason. Okay. Okay, you're closing. Closing, you're making this a cold case, okay, whatever. 
and then I told talk to my lawyer. We would like to give them a briefing to just explain to them. No, my clients don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear any more excuses. You're making this a cold case, okay? Left it from there. Were they going to press charges? No charges. No, we're not pressing any charges. Not even for everything else? No. Okay. Okay. You know what? This was around the time my dad passed away from the grief, you know, of my brother. I already lost my brother. I lost my dad too. Okay, I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired. You know, he was getting better. He was getting better. And I didn't have time to help my dad because I was fighting so hard and my dad died. My dad was my best friend other than my brother, right? We talked on the daily too, you know, tell your brother, I swear I'll be a better dad. If he just come visit me with you, you know, yeah, dad, I'll convince him. And we didn't get that chance. Um, so my dad passed away. I, it was hard. It was typical. It was really hard to get back up again after that. Um, the holidays came by, it was really hard. What was I supposed to do? I got a private investigator. Um, I don't, I hope that he can help me. And, you know, um, in January, actually funniest thing, after they had told me that they were making the case cool, they're not charging anybody. Guess what I find out? First week of January. Um, Seth, Har Seth Harp um, from Rolling Stones um, had done a story, you know, and had interviewed me and I had told him that it happened and I had even given him the names that I thought, again, they were not confirmed. So I thought they were these people. I just kind of confided in him. He said, okay, you know what? Let me find out. He messaged me. He's like, did you know that Alex Becerra's arraignment is on the 20th? And I said, what? And he said, yeah. Do you know he's being charged? And I said, no, I didn't know that. The army didn't tell you? No, he's like, actually several people. And I'm like, good to know. And I'm like, thank you, I appreciate it. He's like, you know what? I'm gonna come out with the story next week. I'll send it to you. I'm like, okay, thank you, I appreciate it. I text Dustin, of course. I tell him, he's like, huh. Is it just as upset as I was? Again, I appreciate Dustin. And, um, so he called them and told me he hung up on them because he was really upset because, you know, why didn't you tell us that you were charging anyone? You already told us you weren't going to charge anybody. You know what? They were like, oh, we thought you just wanted to hear about the murder charges, not everything else. Dustin was mad and hung up. And he told them from now on, Everything you tell me has to be on paper because we just can't trust you anymore. Okay, everything's been on paper since then. Um, you know, so after Seth Harp um, did that, Army Times came out with another article listing three other people. There's actually two names I didn't wasn't sure of. Just let me clarify that. One of the names, finally, I got clarity and I'm like, okay, yeah. It's them. And then my lawyer, Dustin, found out more names. And I'm like, okay, so pretty much got all of them. And now they're, they're charging them for lesser charges. But the only thing I can hope for is that they feel some sort of pressure. There's been people posting pictures of them, posting um, their Facebooks, their information where they live, even some family members of theirs. And I mean, why couldn't they just say what happened? Why can't they just come forward? Why, like, what did they think was gonna happen? 
so now me and my family just pray, you know. Um, my private investigator, I know, is also working on it. I just, I just really hope for the best. Um, we're really praying hard. We're really just putting a lot of our faith. Um, I'm still trying to figure out more as much as I can. Um, I'm just, we're just really praying right now. I don't know if you guys have any questions for me. I just feel like I may went on too long. No, you did not, but we think we have tons of questions. I know I do, Terry. <laughs> yes, sorry. Thank you for um, talking with us and, and getting your story out there. It's very heartbreaking to say the least. Um, you've had a lot of injustices done. Um, do you know if Enrique was bullied by any of these seven by any chance? I don't, I don't know. Um, as far as I know, everybody tells me no. Um, there is actually a story I forgot to mention. So once all of this happened, um, there was one briefing um, where his captain wanted to tell me a story about my brother and just what a great individual he was, which was fine. Um, he told me that there was a party in January where there was drinking and there was people who were underage again, which is probably where the girlfriend Anna got in trouble. And so they all went to this party and my brother was supposed to be the designated driver. And this was, um, let me clarify this, Alex Pizarro's car, his Jeep, his white Jeep. And um, my brother was supposed to be the designated driver. Well, he ended up drinking a little bit too much that night. And he told them, I don't feel comfortable driving. I've never been around here and I've had a couple. Well, I'm sure there was probably some curfew they had to go home to. So Alex Becerra decided to drive back home with everybody, pulled over, got a DUI, the party was busted, everybody got in trouble, um, they all had to write statements. So I believe his captain I was telling me that my brother went to him and told him, hey, so I was supposed to be designated driver and this wouldn't have happened if I would have just done what I was supposed to do. And so his captain was like, okay. He's like, I just don't think it's fair because I believe his Alex Becerra got an article 15 or something like that. And he said, I don't think it's fair that he has to just take all the blame when I feel like I should be part of it. Okay, he's like, what are you saying? He's like, I mean, can't we just split the punishment? Sure. My brother had to go to some alcoholic rehab classes or something like that and he also kind of you know got that article 15 as well from what I understood from the story so I mean I from what I know this Becerra guy was looking to get further in the military you can't really get too further ahead with things like that on your record so that's my reason for thinking maybe that's a motive um that's all I know that I could possibly think you know but as far as I know, he wasn't really bullied. He wasn't bullied by these people. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Um, and you have no idea why he went with these people? Yeah, so my understanding from the whole situation was my brother was an iffy, like he was gonna go, not gonna go. Oh. Um, he was mostly asked to go because it was cheaper to split the ferry so they could take their, their, car, their trucks and their cars over. So yeah, my brother, again, was that extra person that, oh, we know he doesn't mind paying. We know he'll go. They used him. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Um, did you go back to, your, to his recruiter and say, so you still think the army is the safest place on earth? You know what? No, I don't remember. I don't even know where this recruiter came from, to be perfectly honest. 
He's probably gone by now. He probably moved. It, 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 he probably is. Um, I really wish I could find out who he is because fuck you, man. If you know his name, you should look him up on Facebook and send him a, a message. I don't remember his That's name. That's okay. I, yeah, I try to look through his my brother's paperwork. I'm like, it's got to be somewhere, like something. I just couldn't find it personally. Understandable. So I'm going to find it one day. You, yeah, I would too if I were you. Say, you know, um, um, do you, when did they go through and pack his room? Do you know? Um, was it after? It his, was way after. We actually just what? recently got his stuff back. Um, not recently. Let me think. Um, but it was after they found his, his head. Okay. I was Yeah, it was it was after I believe December even of that same year. It took a really long time. He went to get his remains back, you know, so we could bury him. It took a really long time. It took like three months. Wow. Makes yeah. you wonder why it took so long. Thankfully, um, the only thing that does give me a little bit of peace is the fact that I know it was um, the county um, that did the autopsy the you know for the Carteret region and um, that makes me feel better because at least the initial autopsy wasn't done by them and I talked to him and I you know I asked him like they're not going to do anything right they don't have it's like they have no jurisdiction over me no if that's what you're asking like okay I just wanted to clear it up Um, did it feel like to you when, when they were questioning you about your brother, did it feel like they were, um, during his disappearance, did it feel like they were trying to place blame on him or you for his disappearance? Um, so I don't. I don't feel like they were trying to place the blame on me, but they were definitely, I feel like digging for dirt um, to kind of say like, you know, are you sure your brother wasn't a drug addict? Like, you know, and I said, I honestly, who doesn't smoke some weed once in a while, but I don't even think he did that here. You can't get that here, right? You can't do drugs in the base. And he stayed silent. So um, it, it felt more like, Maybe they were asking me these questions. Um, maybe they wanted to help, maybe not. But in my opinion, it just, you should know him by now. This is your soldier. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Mm -hmm. um, God, I think that was all of my questions. I know I'm missing one or two. I didn't write them down. Um, Anybody else have questions for her? Yeah. Okay, I got it. <laughs> it's like, how do I unmute this thing? Well, first of all, I just want to say, wow. I, um, I, th I feel like I'm on a time trap, travel, time travel trip with you because you know, both of our soldiers came from the th same base and share the same colonel, <laughs> uh, yeah. Colonel uh, Scotty Otan. And I'm sure many more uh, connections like we could probably make with some names. By the way, I just want to say that your CID investigator that you first had was probably, his name was Noe Hernandez. No, no, no. His name was John. John. Okay. Because that John was mine, and he was very, but very similar to to your guy. And um, I, you know, I guess I wish I'd thought of it at the time. My my casualty assistance officer, he did a good job of kind of navigating that emotional, those emotional moments with the CID, because uh, they were really digging holes for themselves, <laughs> and I was just like pinpointing every single one of them. Oh my god! I did so awful. many, so much investigating by myself. I I hear what you're saying. I mean, like you, first of all, your hands have been so full 
you know, I know you're taught what you're talking about, you know, as far as God and the universe and everything, but there's a calling here, like a Joan of Arc, like type calling in your life. And I'm just like, I'm, you know, look at the strength behind you. I mean, your brother's murder, <laughs> you know, has got to propel you forward and push you onward. And it is like uh, reclimbing a mountain without any kind of protective gear. It's like, whatever, you know, hardest thing that you can possibly think of. But I see how smart and brilliant that you are. Oh, thank you. And uh, resilient. And, um, you know, like you had to be your own advocate, your own detective. I, I think about the, the commonalities between a lot of these deaths, murders, whatever, I think about, uh, you know, your brother, and I think about Terry, about Brandon and Caleb, what beautiful people they, they were, you know, the kindest, uh, you know, um, people, um, maybe like you said, too kind, you know, um, and I think people take advantage of that, that oh, kind definitely. of, that kindness. Oh, definitely. Um, I'm, I, I see, you know, I'm seeing like, this happened to your brother um, on a holiday and the same thing happened to my son on a holiday. And what I've read in my own, on Caleb's investigation is a lot of um, shirking responsibility and drunkenness. I, I say, you know, they say that they're the super duper paratroopers and I say, you know, <laughs> they're the super stupor paratroopers. Mm -hmm. They're not being the valiant airborne soldiers, the elite airborne that you know Mr. Scotty Otan wanted to walk around base with us and flaunt, you know, mm -hmm. and that the fact that they're family and that they know each other, they don't know anybody. They don't know each other. They're not doing any kind of, of, uh, Oh, they, they used to call it Oak Tree Counseling, where it's a face-to-face -face check. There's a, there is a bond, an unbroken bond. And there is, has got to be, like, we're bringing up all of the, we're, it, we're a ma massive mighty cleanse here. We're all of the, the junk is kind of coming up to the surface and we're going, look at that, look at this, look at this, this is all happening. When you have 75% of your, our, our soldiers that die non-combat and 93% of them die on their own territory on U.S. soil, it's just yeah. outrageous. I'm curious about his phone. You said his phone was, he didn't take his phone. So have you been able to get into his phone? I just got his phone back. Um... I don't have the heart yet. I'm not going to lie. Um, I just got the report um, also. Well, if you're able to get into that, wouldn't it, there be possibly some evidence in text messages and things like that? Oh, yeah. yeah. I honestly, I just, I haven't, I have, I haven't had the heart. I'm not going to lie. It's, it's, I know I have to give myself time. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And especially because my, my dad's death just really, um, pushed me over um yeah i know it took me um with uh it, it, it when i got caleb's cid investigation the whole packet in front of me it took me about a month or two before i could even crack it open and then and then you're adding you know i mean we the the thing is is that we've had tragedies along not just not just the tragedy of our our the passing of our our um, service member, but also the, the, the things that happen in, in a family after this, your father dying, my daughter harming herself, self-harm, you know, emotional harm. It's just, Terry, you know, I don't know, but, you know, I mean, it's, how are you guys, how are you guys, um, 
what are you doing to take care of yourself? Well, I mean, I was immersing myself in doing everything I could for my brother. Um, in the beginning, um, I guess after my dad, I just, just been taking it day by day. Um, I'm not gonna lie, drinking helps. <laughs> it sounds <laughs> awful, but man, does it help. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm not an alcoholic like my dad though, but it, I definitely, you know, um, I've been working a lot more. I mean, I guess they're not, they're not exactly healthy meth methods. Um, I talk to friends. Um, I should see a therapist. Um, it's kind of hard for me. Um, my mom doesn't want to see a therapist. I'm her therapist. Um, so she got a dog. The dog's been helping. She had a roommate that was helping. Um, my sister moved away from us. Um, I'm not really sure how she copes. I know she's not having a great time with it. I just She's not really honest with me about it. Um, just taking it day by day. Um, I think for me, my like just visiting my brother's grave. We buried him close by, just visiting him, um, writing in a journal, <laughs> just trying to figure it out for myself. You know, I, I know therapy isn't bad. It's just, I guess, maybe not for me. <laughs> I have a lot of, <sighs> it's hard for me to talk about. So, I understand. I have, yeah, yeah, and and I'll, I'll tell you that the 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 I, I go to the the uh, counseling center at the VA, and they've been so sweet. But it's, the thing is, is just finding. I think having found you, and Terry, and Kimberly, and so many others, um, each time I get to talk to um, a family that has been through the same thing and this walk. This, this, you know, who, who can we relate to? You know, I mean, I certainly are really, there. Yes. It's, not, it's not, these are not common issues, or are they? <laughs> yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? God bless. <laughs> I take that back. But, but you know what I mean? People are, uh, we don't even know where to turn to, um, to help. And so that's why I'm so grateful. I'm, I'm so honored that you came on the, um, our, our podcast today. And I just, um, I, I want to ask too, like, what do you need? Do you guys have a website or like, what is it that you're working on? What's your next step? What, what can we do to support you? Huh? Well, I'm trying to quit my job. <laughs> so my it's job a full-time job. <laughs> I'll tell you. Yeah. My job is awful. You know, I don't want to work there anymore. <laughs> so that's one. Um, I guess um, right now with everything picking back up again, um, the only thing I can do is just, I've been trying to get in as many um, news networks as I could. Lulek's been a big help with that. And um, trying to do as many podcasts, trying to really get my brother's word out there because the more people know about these, these seven individuals now that their names are out, the more pressure they're gonna feel that this is real. Even if I go to jail and I come out, people are going to know my name. People are know that I'm That's tied to right. this case. You know, um, there Bring was one it. comment. Yeah, there was one <laughs> comment on the Facebook that was like, I just saw this guy last night. And I told him about how I had an article 15 when I was in the military. He said, yeah, me too. And I asked him if it had anything to do with this case. And he said, no, what a scum. So, you know, it's just... Uh, right now, I know that's what I can do. I can't. I'm trying to pressure the FBI to take over the case. They've told me before they're really just helping. Um, yeah. Honestly, it should have been their case. They do pick and choose what they take on. And I mean, that's really it. I, I, all I've got at the moment. You know, um, I the GoFundMe pages. I, you know, I. I don't really man that as much. I'm just like, I guess, you know, I don't, I, I have a hard time asking people to do things. It's, it's. <laughs> well, so, I think that we love you. We want to, we want to do what we can to help you. And, you know, we, the people want to support you. And so, Hey, you might want to uh, shoot us your, your uh, GoFundMe information, um, be, you know, 
it doesn't hurt to have just, I mean, like you've, you've mentioned already, lawyer fees and, and, and plane tickets and things like that. I mean, you, we know it's not over. This is just like the, 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 the brink of the beginning for all of, for me, I mean, like, yes, like our, our uh, uh, soldiers died about the same, around the same time. Yeah. You know, I remember when, when um, Enrique's story came out and I was just blown, I mean, I was blown to smithereens anyway. And then of course, here comes Shanta Marie Block and Terry Caserta on my page. Uh, and I, and, and so this whole idea of, like, I mean, I'm like, I'm with your mother on this. It's like this, this, this yeah. whole idea, you know, it's the safest place in the world is the army. I mean, I think we've proven, you know, <laughs> at this point. Yeah, you know, that's a damn lie. <laughs> on, on base at Fort Bragg alone, 40 something odd deaths, you know, exactly. in 2020. And one is too many, you know, and they just need to reflect on it. And I've told many people before, like, the whole army system needs to be redone. The whole thing, you know, there's so many things going on. There's so much bullying. There's sexual harassment is rampant. Like it's so much going on that needs to be fixed. And, you know, the hardest part is getting attention to that. And, you know, I've always said it before. Um, I don't believe my brother's death for a second was in vain. I don't believe my brother's death at all. There, I don't ever want to believe that my brother's death was for no reason. I don't, you know, all the blessings that I've gotten, you know, the way that I've been able to, I guess, just navigate through it, get people on my side, try to really just, everything I've done hasn't been just for nothing. There's a bigger reason for it. Um, what I think it is, is this the whole army just needs to be changed and there has to be movement for it. The hardest part is getting the army to change just even a little bit. And even with the Vanessa Guillen Act that has finally passed, there's how difficult was that? She had to die as well. You know, she was, her body was cut up into pieces, burned, put into concrete, you know, her case was just as bad as my brother's. And, you know, uh, Kayla too, and Brandon, like, how normal people don't die like that you know I mean, there's just it's bringing people together there's the army needs to change just so much crd does not have to be a wing within the army either it needs to be its own separate and if it's going to be it's separate it needs more <laughs> funding as well their their whole reason at this point <laughs> yes yes you know um i'm sick and tired of you know the army, the military gets so much of the taxes, the revenue that the United States gets. And you can't tell me, you can't figure out who murdered my brother when you have seven suspects. Seven, not one, not half. You have seven suspects. And you, you tell me you don't have the resources to figure it out. It's just crazy. It blows my mind. You know what they do? They outsource all of that money to other companies so it goes back to the big corporations you know and maybe i'm just a little bit of a conspiracist but um my opinion what are they doing with all that money because it's certainly not going to our soldiers my brother was paid minimum wage advertising yes they're minimum spending wage. it on advertising <laughs> yeah their biggest well, budget well it's awful you know they just people. want us to go away they want all the gold star families to go away and pretend like none of this ever happens. That's what they want. Yeah, I mean, my honestly, not not that even after I find out what happened with my brother, I don't want to stop. Like, because it's not just me, it's not just you guys. There's gonna be future us, you know? Yes. And that's not gonna change until someone does anything about it. And you know, it's just so sad to get to try to even get that attention. And that's why we have to be the link and the chain that the unbroken link and we have to help each other. I had this kind of image of like this being obliterated after you find out about your, your uh, service member and you're just like paddling alone on this dark ocean, you know, yep. how you run into somebody else and you just go, you're just like totally like taken back with their story. It's just like, but yet there's commonalities 
And if we don't, if you didn't speak up about your, your brother, if Terry, if Brandon, if, if Terry and Brandon and, and Patrick hadn't stood up, if, if I just let this go, like so many people want me to do for some odd reason, you know, but yeah. God blessed me, God, God blessed you and Terry with the tenacity, the resilience uh, to rise above all this. And we are, we are all going to push through together. We are going to take this wall down brick by brick. And they just didn't even know what hit them because they picked the wrong soldiers. They really yeah. did. <laughs> yeah, they did, you know. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't, honestly, like, I can only imagine there's going to be someone else. I can't imagine how many families they pushed over. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, think it, about it. We're the only, like, how, there was 40 deaths, 40 non-combat deaths on base at Fort Bragg last year, or 2020. Yes. Who knows what that, the numbers were last year, you know, probably went up from there. But, like, how many of those have we heard about? Exactly. Exactly. And you know, I think the, the families that aren't speaking out are afraid. Many of them. I mean, I lost my brother. I have, I lost my dad now. I have nothing else to be, what else do I have to lose? You know, my, my mom, she's okay, but she's not who she was before. Well, what do I have to lose? I don't have anything else. I don't have kids. I don't, you know, we're on the front lines right now. <laughs> Yeah. In a battle that we never even knew existed. And we yeah. certainly couldn't have fathomed it. Yeah, you know, I tell people all the time, I never thought in a million years it was going to be my brother. Never. And it can be your, your child. Just keep that in mind when you go and you vote for your next representative, when you vote for your next president, when you vote for your next senator, even. This, you keep that in mind, your kid who is in the, in the military, it can be your kid because it happens in the Air Force, it happens in the Army, it happens in the Navy, it happens in the Marines, like, mm -hmm. it, it can be you guys, so if you want to go through everything that, you know, we've been through, then choose not to do anything about it, but in, until then, I mean, if you don't want to suffer what we've gone through, then I urge everybody to vote, you know? And I think I can speak a little bit for, for my, well, I don't want to make this race, but for, for my, my demographic, um, it's important for them to know. They don't know, you know? Yes. They don't see these stories too often, you know, until, you know, people like me and Vanessa Gaines' mom blow it up. And it's, they're very used to, <sighs> you know, sweeping it under the floor oh well you know no you know like it's not about that anymore everybody has to do every parent should do something every single one because you know bigger numbers and we're stronger and in my opinion i think we gotta make it hurt where their pockets hurt you know or make their pockets hurt so absolutely Absolutely. The, we need to, to the, the reconstruct or something needs to happen with the Ferris Doctrine. That, that, that it's, it's prohibiting, you know, it's allowing, it's allowing a lot of negligence and just outright blatant murder. And, you know, there's no, there's no, um, there's no middle ground on that. It's the same. Oops. Yep. So, and we have no recourse when this happens. We have nothing. We can't yep. sue them. We, we can't even, they won't even let us talk to commands. Anyway, in, in my situation, they, they mm -hmm. opened their doors to us to nothing. I mean, we weren't even invited to his memorial service. And, and so we couldn't ask anybody questions. Um, we're not allowed to. So the only way things are going to get fixed in the military is if we start holding them accountable. And I don't mean like Vanessa Guillen's chain of command, just moving them. I mean, you, you, um, their rank needs to be down to an E1. 
They need to be kicked out with no VA benefits, with no retirement, with nothing. And that's still not enough because they need to do jail time, in my opinion. And when they start doing that, that's when the culture is going to change. And when you really think about it, what if this was the president, what punishment would they give him? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But they, but they don't they don't think that our family members are important enough. And nope. quite honestly, that's that's the worst thing you could say to to the family. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, I'm spiteful. I believe eye for an eye, but I guess, you know. <laughs> well, you're in the right group. Yes. <laughs> Very much so. You know, I, I do a lot of things out of spite and it's, it's gotten me to places it's awful to say. Um, I'm very spiteful. So I'm not going to live this, you know, I'm not going to let them live it down because I just don't want to be in a place where there's no consequence. Um, me and my brother always talked about what's fair and what's just, you know, and just, no, no, when we're just, I'm just not, it has to change. I won't let there be another Griselda. I won't there be, let there be another Terry, another Maria, another Heather, you know, I'm not gonna let there be another Myra Guillen or, um, you know, Mama Guillen, another, no, like there shouldn't be, no, no one has to go through that, you know, no one does. And why are we lobbying? Why are we asking the media to help us? That's wrong. That's sad. That's you're always part of the family until you're trying to get someone in trouble or trying to get someone, you know, reprimanded. And I'm I don't want that. Like I'm done with that. I should not have to do that. You know, there should be a whistleblower line for military. I don't know if there already is, but why is that not advertised a lot more? You know, just something's got to give. There's got to be some safe place for our soldiers because retaliation is a thing. And if they're trying to act like it's not and they already have things to implement it, they are the biggest liars in the whole world, much bigger liars and politicians. So, you know, I just, we have to make this work. And that's what I tell everybody, you know, I've told uh, Norma Torres, the Congresswoman has been a big help as well. Um, and, you know, I've talked to her, I'm like, it's, it's got to change. No, there is, I've never seen just the amount of retaliation that is just allowed in a place than there. You know, the army, we're supposed to look at them to defend us. So you mean to tell me they have favorites? They have, you know, I don't know. I guess what I'm trying to say is it needs to stop. Well, and they do have an instruction for zero tolerance for um, retaliation. Well, they just don't, they don't let anybody know about it. And I found this out because of, you know, Brandon, uh, there's, there's one for no bullying, hazing, retaliation, reprisal, of course, sexual assault, sexual harassment, and nobody is held accountable, not one person. And they have There's an instruction. Why is there zero tolerance? And my son, Vanessa Guillen, and anybody else who was, who died due to these things, they, why, if there's zero tolerance, why? I don't get it, I don't get it. So at their convenience um, yep. when they decide to. And that's the part that is the unjust. And they need to be, they obviously, how long has it been? They obviously cannot be trusted to run themselves. You know, they need, they need an overhead. I'm sorry. Well, you and they lost that. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh no, you, they lost that privilege, you know? They lost that ability to show that they can leave and they cannot leave. Yes. 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 And, and um, dude, I forgot what I was going to say. 
<laughs> you get so fired up. I, I know, it. right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. That's not very important. This, I, I was going to say, why are the same people that 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 were responsible for the the health and well being of my son still in leadership? Why are the people that when Caleb went to the ER, he was turned away the very first time, and then he went back two more consecutive times? Why are they not being held accountable? Ooh, because you know, they pick and, and choose. Still, yes, yeah. and they're they still pick and choose. taking care of our our paratroopers over there yeah honestly with caleb like man i would have been like i would oh my god i if that happened to i i can only imagine like the frustration you felt like i would have been like girl i made I, a I would have burned line down. to the cid <laughs> i may on, on when whenever i went for the memorial you know you were talking about or you know how you wanted to go see where roman had been I was like, yeah, I was like, where's this room? And they wouldn't let me go see it. And, and then I, I told my casualty assistance officer that they assigned me there. They wouldn't let me have my own casualty assistance officer come with me. So they assigned oh. me in a casualty assistance officer over there. And, um, you know, I was like, I want to go to the CID. Everybody else went Home, you know, back to the hotel to take a nap. And I was like, I want to go meet with Adam Armstrong right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You better let me talk to that man. And I was like, I want to see the pictures. Where's where's the, where's his autopsy pictures? Yeah, that's medical negligence what they did. Oh that yeah. Medical. And I think someone actually sued the army for that. Um, they had cancer or something like that. They had sued them previously for that, that they, they weren't allowed to, I don't know. Anyways, I, I, that makes me so angry because I told my brother, he had told me at one point, if you go to the doctor too much here, you get in trouble. I'm like, I don't give a shit what anyone thinks <laughs> at all because you bet your ass that if something happens to you and you can't work or you can't be, they're going to need to pay for 100% of your disability. And I'm like, and I have a problem with it. Oh my God, we're going to lawyer up, homie boy. Except for, you know, the fact that Brandon here, he broke his leg and they still made him run on it. Are you serious? You know? Yes. Oh and that was what it was just like one thing after another after that. Yeah. He was in he was in SEALs when that happened. He was in SEAL training. Yeah. Yeah. And they rang the bell for him. And the, the whole thing was um, an injustice to Brandon, which put him on the road to Norfolk. And then we know the history of that. But yeah, they need they, to start holding people accountable. They do because that's someone's health. And I mean, they just look at them as, the, here's the thing. Here's the thing that I've realized. They look at the soldiers as disposable. Like that's really like, you know, when you get that bag of the green soldiers at the 99 cent store and you really don't count them. You really don't, you know, notice when, you know, one or two is missing, or maybe you lose a few and you're just like, oh, okay. It's so sad to say that is exactly how the army treats our soldiers. But yes. here's the thing, they're not just toys. They're real people. You can't go to the 99 cent store and buy them again. You just can't. You know, go ahead. Oh, the day that the army can bring people back to life, then maybe I'll lay off. But until then, that's that's not it's it's not even fat you know it's not a thing no but when they have that okay maybe but no <laughs> <laughs> you know what we were told what was it we were told that losing a service member is the cost of doing business well dang Who isn't it five hundred thousand dollars to train a soldier or a pair a, a service member what in the world are they talking about? Think about how much money that is. But it's the cost of doing business. MR. Oh my gosh. You know they are, what? They are so expendable. They're like bullets and a gun and they're not the weapons. You know. So sad. What a waste. That's, I wish the media would show things like that, you know? I wish that things, lines like those. You know? Go ahead. 
I just wish that lines like those were actually headliners, you know, not, oh, Kim Kardashian was seen holding hands with this person. Like, no, these are people's kids. These are people's spouses. These are people's siblings, cousins, best friends. These are friends. people that protect you. These are the people that are protecting you. We tell. Oh, of... oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I would love it if someone made a, a whole documentary about how the army is a business and not an actual army. Yeah, they're, they're in business for themselves. But we have told almost every reporter that we've talked to that we were told service members, losing service members is the cost of doing business. And they refuse to print it or to put it on the on the. TV and it's because Maybe. it makes the it makes the military look bad. That's why they don't do it. Well, maybe we need to find the right reporter, the right journalist who's really hungry, who really wants the story, who really wants because there's plenty. Have to be somebody brave. Exactly. Hence the reason of this podcast. <laughs> <Ta -da>! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't hold back. That's exactly. right. Exactly. Exactly. Oh yeah. So I'm on uh I'm on 80. I want to I'm gonna uh just a few things I want to say. I'm on 82nd Airborne Division's tw Twitter page right now. Oh, okay. and, it, and it's titled All American Division. In the 82nd Airborne Division, we take care of each other because our people are a national treasure and our number one priority. Bullshit. <laughs> I call bullshit. And then yeah. I find one by Lieutenant Colonel Scotty Otten. Oh, yeah. Uh, August 2020, where you guys, there's pictures of you on the beach with him, um, and you're sharing a prayer, and that your families are bonded and resolved, and your resolve is steel. To ensure we get justice for Roman. That's the words of Colonel Scotty Otten. So he's he's all about justice for Roman no. on his Twitter page. Cause he knows um, General Donahue's looking me. at it. <laughs> he blocked me. But 83. <laughs> 83 active duty soldiers between January 2020 and June 2021 have died. 83. Wow. Yep. Say that, uh, say the dates again. Between January 2020 and June 2021, that's 18 months. 83 active duty soldiers have died on Fort Bragg. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's, it's honestly, it's just, it's it's awful. And we will you know? share this podcast. Griselda, your friends and family can listen to this podcast on their Android or iPhones. Okay. On uh, Apple, Amazon, Audible, Spotify, all your major podcast platforms okay perfect i just want to say how proud of you i'm so proud of you you're a young lady who was thrust into this position and you did it you said that you Thank didn't you. know what you were doing but you did it and you know and and you're a young lady and your brother was only in not that long and he was about to get out which totally is devastating to hear yeah but you are just mature beyond your years you're i i don't know if you've always been this way or is this is you were turned in you know you have to be this new woman you're amazing you, know, you were thank you for you're gonna do great things. i love how you call yes Thank you. And you're we gonna believe in you. You're gonna come on the show again. You're gonna come on the show as a subject matter expert. 
when we have a new family on here who's dealing with trauma that all three of you have had to deal with. You are now subject matter experts and it's up to us to help these newborn gold stars to survive. Well, the goal is that there's not going to be thrive. no more. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, I would hope that my goal is there shouldn't be any more, yeah. no more in American soil. I mean, of course, if they're overseas and we're in war, right, we got to do what we got to do to protect the country, but no more, you know, at the hands right. of their own brethren, you know, no more of that, no more passing, um, passing the blame onto someone, passing, you know, um, no more of any of that. Like there has to be consequences. There cannot be any more failed leadership. And honestly, in my opinion, um, they could use a lot more leadership classes because there should be, there shouldn't be a me, there shouldn't be Heather, there shouldn't be Terry, there shouldn't be any of us here today, you know, if there was real leadership, you know, it's enough is thing. enough. Exactly. I just cannot believe, you know, I've worked in a jewelry store for all of my life, but I cannot believe that their HR department or they're just their whole whistleblower line, their whole, you know, their whole just collective of like, okay, the, the employee matters is so much better than the army. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just, yeah. Just typical work, Isn't you know, that, yeah. it's way better than the whole army. And yeah. it's just, it's unbelievable. I'm so sorry that this nation failed you and your family, Griselda. You know what? All I can do now is try to make it better, right? That's all any of us can do. Yeah. Now we just need people to listen. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We have to get the right people to listen. And that's, well, it's hard. <laughs> I think it we is. all know it's hard. I think LULAC is huge, though. They are making waves. I had never heard of them before this, so they are definitely making waves. So yep. I hope that they can they can make changes, and I hope that that's something that they want to stick to. Um, I just really hope that this is the beginning of just change in general. Yeah, I I agree. Oh man, Kimberly, do you want to take us out? Thank. You. Yeah. Um, you know. It's, I've said this before that, you know, my service was one of the best decisions that I ever made. But at this time, I cannot with confidence give my support of any American enlisting from this moment forward until we hold people accountable. Congressmen, senators, hold hold the Pentagon accountable. Pentagon, hold your senior leaders and senior leaders, hold your junior leaders and your service members accountable so that beautiful young men like Enrique can use his benefits or have a lifelong career in the military. He deserved all of those things. Look how cute he is. He looks really good in that uniform, <laughs> you know? And right now, guess what? 82nd Airborne is not deserving of him, you know? We're done, we're tired. And, and when it comes down to it, is their line so that their enlistment numbers don't, lower so that they don't go down start telling start telling people if you hear of someone who wants to enlist tell these stories tell them 75 percent of all military deaths are non-combat and 93 percent of those deaths happen on u.s soil and then all of a sudden maybe those education and health benefits don't seem as big as a deal you know, it, this, his death was preventable. And it's still like, has 
I know that your congresswoman has asked the Pentagon to do an uh, a IG review of the investigation. Have you gotten anything back on that? Not so far. She's asked and it's just now it's just on public pressure to do it, which is why I'm trying to start this, you know, whole campaign back up again to try to get it back to help to have people help me really on just pressuring them. You know, I just the army has shown me they just can't do it. And that's okay. If you can't do it. Just say so pass it on to someone who can. So is there something that, that yeah. the American people can do to help support you in that? Like, is there, I mean, um, writing to congressmen, you know, from what I understand, um, that'll, you know, if several congressmen are pre pressuring the FBI to take on this case, you know, yeah. so it, call it, your congressman. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Call congress your congressman or woman and have them you know bring it up because it's it's just it's yeah it's public so, pressure you know yeah what i've noticed is that we just have to do a lot of educating we have to do a lot of educating people just don't know and so if we don't if we we have to step up to the plate and do that first and then <laughs> once once people know then we can start like hey it holding people accountable on those levels too you know yes um ladies take care of yourself make sure Thank to take you. that time for self-care journal griselda oh i do that in your wine or whatever <laughs> i'm a whiskey we support girl. you <laughs> <laughs> i'm a whiskey girl you know okay all right okay. <laughs> all right and if you ever need anything, hit us up. Of course. Yeah. Thank you, ladies, so much. Yeah, I, I know. Everybody keeps telling me, you need to learn to reach out. And I'm like, hey, it's very difficult for me, but I am learning. Well, we okay. will reach out to you. We will keep up with you. Yes. And um, Absolutely. just don't forget that you have <laughs> some sisters here that have got your back. And Thank we've you. got some powerful, powerful warriors watching over us. So yeah, push yeah, us absolutely. together. Yeah. You know, I believe it. I believe it because I feel like it's crazy. Sometimes I feel like my brother is with me. Um, and I, I know that he's with me. And so I, I try to try to be like, okay, just give me strength. Just give me strength. I just need to keep going, you know? <laughs> So, he, yeah he's your battle buddy exactly exactly it was me and my brother all the time we always figured everything out together we always you know as much as I mommied him around he was definitely there for me too you know he was always especially when I fought with my mom or my sister I call them they're, they're crazy he's like you know they're crazy just let it go <sighs> so sorry for your last Christmas day. It's okay. I just can just try to help to prevent it for someone else. You are definitely a force to be reckoned with, and we appreciate oh, thank you. you coming and telling your story. That's that's a way to heal is to tell your story. Yes, yes, I've learned that, and talking about him and telling people about him, and you know, I tell people I'm not perfect. I still cry. I don't cry as much as I used to, but I still cry and. Yeah, I just wish people knew my brother because he would be here. If, you know, if he was still alive, he would be here. He would be an advocate. He would be an ally. He would be working hard, you know. But it's okay. That's why I'm here. I'll do all the things that he wanted to do for him. Yeah. All right, locked and loaded diary listeners. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next time. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good job. Yay. <laughs>
If you have a U.S. military service member that was killed due to a non-combat incident and would like to tell your story, please contact us at lockedandloaded diaries at gmail.com.